Yeah, they had an engine outside, didn't they? It's one of the engines that used to run around the factory. Bogey cart. No. Grief. Stoneware basins used to mix acid and waste cotton, nitro cotton, produced as a result of this process. They mixed together into cordite paste and paste was transferred to the moss band area where it was gelatinized with the aid of alcohol and solvent, extruded in the form of cords and dyes by hydraulic pressure and finally dried in stoves to produce cordite. This is what they shoved into the shells. Let's have a quick look round the outside of the museum first. An Anderson shelter. So that was the uh, Minister of Agriculture. That was Dig, dig for Victory, isn't it? That yeah, was. yeah. Yeah, it was named after the Lord Privy Seal Sir John Anderson and were built from sectionised galvanised corrugated steel designed to stand a strong impact and absorb energy without collapsing. Fancy sitting in there where there's an air raid on. Mm. Mm. <laughs> encouraged to dig for victory as well. They're still growing cabbages here. I think they could stop digging now. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of onions here. Sorry? Onions. Onions, yeah. Yeah, grow your own vegetables. Obviously for the risk of starvation, so it will encourage to build their own. By 1943 there were three and a half million allotments in Britain that produced over one million tonnes of vegetables a year. Well, after the war, Britain still suffered from food shortages. Post-war austerity meant that some foods were rationed until 1954. Mm. Right, let's go in. People don't realise what this war is like. It's fact not war with treacherous Germans, but murder. The guns are much more superior. Little bullets and knives and things. A telephone. Yeah. <laughs> like the rattle. Oh, the Gretna Green disaster, I think Quintus, Quintins, Quintins Hill, Quintins Hill, yeah, worst white rail disaster in British history. Same up there. Express sets off northwards, troop train leaves Lard at slow goods train leaves Carlisle, troop train takes on the water at Carstairs, express from London is due to leave but it's 30 minutes late. Choose to start work. It starts 30 minutes late. Train arrives and shunt, he shunts it onto the wrong side of the track. He accepts the train from Kirkpatrick. The troop train enters the Quintus, Quintins Hill section. Express enters the Quintins Hill section and the troop train glided with the local train, express train. 
collides with derailed section of troop train. Oh my goodness. 246 people were injured, many seriously. 229 people killed. Wow. So see, the collision was so violent that the train, which had been 195 metres long, was compressed to just 61 Six metres. So. series of uh, things going wrong wasn't it? Yeah. Guilty of manslaughter. Failure to abide by the rules. Well, they were released on uh, petition to the king. That's right. 26 of May 1915. Yeah. 26 of May 20 they boarded the train on the 22nd. Alright, they were off to Gallipoli, the soldiers. Oh dear. So, Grandad's brother was killed on the way over there. Yeah. Fire in the carriages raged for 24 hours. They got, took Carlisle Fire Brigade took two hours to arrive. They were just nine miles away. It was not until the morning of the next day that fire was finally extinguished. Oh. That was the cost of the war. Said the local towns of Annan, Longtown, Gretna Green and Dawn and whole communities of men signed up and he died fighting for the freedom which we enjoy today. 65 million fought, 8 million killed, 200,000, 2 million died of diseases and illness. What does that say? 21,200,000 wounded, 8 million, sorry, 7,800,000 taken prisoner, and 6,600,000 civilians killed. civilians killed. Yeah, yeah. Just unimaginable, isn't it? Yeah. Medals. Military medals and cap badges. Your grand, we still got your granddad's campaign yeah, medal, hasn't we? Yeah, the two that he's got. The, the, that one. That one. That, oh, that one. one. Yeah. yeah. Slanks there. Slanks regiment. Yeah. And my granddad's brother, who was. He was in the Hampshire. Hampshire he was in the Hampshire. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, so in 1915 the need for shells so to stop their attacks because they were running out of shells. They were losing battle because they didn't have enough ammunition. Spent cases. George. Oh, George. He was Minister of Munitions mm, yeah. in 1915. Yeah, so you've got the uh, drink drink laws, haven't you? So drunken behaviours of the navvies while brave men died and the growing shortage of basic food such as bread increased the calls for prohibition. That's when they reduced the pub out, didn't they? Well, they, they changed the hours, didn't they? Yeah, yeah that's right. Thousand workers who built the Gretna factory were Irish navvies. The legacy was not only the vast factory infrastructure, but a new social experiment to curb drinking. So they had a huge appetite for work and an even larger appetite for drink. The night like, of the thousand whiskies. What's that? It says one in famous occasion known as the night of the thousand whiskies. Good grief. A thousand whiskies lined up on the bar for his thirsty customers to be downed in a couple of minutes. And of course, the, the war changed the status of women forever. The role which women played in public affairs helped advance their position to gain the vote, and for the first time, many women had access to higher wages. <laughs> there you are. Yeah, not really trying to make you feel guilty at all. The 
HM factory Gretna, women made up to 70% of the workplace. That's a clock in, isn't it? Yeah, it's a clock in, in clock. Yeah. It was used in World War II at Powerfoot, and was similar to those used at factory Gretna. Hard drinking navvies again. The level of drunkenness and violence overwhelmed local police forces with 953 cases of drunkenness in Carlisle alone by June 1916. It was called the newest, the largest and the most remarkable brainchild of David Lloyd George and his right-hand man K.B. Quinnon, but it was a band of chemists, engineers, supervisors and munition girls who worked tirelessly to bring about its success. Each played a vital role in creating the ammunition that would win the war. Let's see how big it was. The nitric acid stores. Good grief. Glycerin distillery. did before the munitions girls, shop assistants, factory, laundry, other 45% were domestic servants. It's making nitric and sulfuric acid. Whew. could be highly dangerous which of acid keep coming over every now and again and used to fairly take your breath away and gums were all poisoned with acid and I had to have all my teeth taken out oh. so they dressed there to wear khaki khaki dress trim with red yoke piece with a mop cap yeah that was a nitrating pan Used to put, uh, put the hands in it. Yeah. They used to mix acid orange. yeah, and waste cotton to make nitro cotton, and that was the first stage, and that was the devil's porridge. What was that? Yeah. yeah. So once the cord out was made and pressed into cords, it inspected and any defective pieces discarded. The dried cordite was stored in the case houses where each case was marked with a serial number and inspected by a chemist before being passed as ready for dispatch. And some of the shells. They've really got the production up, don't they? 10 tonnes in the first week. So 10 tonnes the first week, 90 tonnes mid October 2016, 40 tonnes October 6, 400 tonnes and then a fat 1100 tonnes at the end of June 1917. So I had a royal visit in 1917 with uh, Queen Mary. You've been watching The Crown, haven't you, sir? So. Yeah, yeah, she's, <laughs> she died recently, Queen Mary. In The Crown? In The Crown, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ninety fifty three. 1953, I think she yeah, died. Yeah, yeah. So a home from home. So the hut was divided into one part dining room, the other sleeping quarters, cordoned off by thick curtains to form rooms for two. So it became obviously it became a way of life. Yeah. Did they go home? They don't presumably they didn't go home. No. They had a limited number of personal possessions they could bring with them. They were allowed to decorate their dorms. They had a dressing table, hairbrush, mirror and clothes. Souvenir China was sold to the munitions workers when they left the factory. But that was a tiny bed, isn't it? Yeah. You get a copyright strike for that, you think? Uh, <laughs> I think it might be out of copyright by now. Life in the hostels. When we first moved, they were put into a hostel. And after you were there so long, they moved you into the rough ones out and put them in a very large building. After that, you could go to a bungalow with four girls and a matron. But I didn't bother because I liked it at the hostel. 
<laughs> Good girls and bad girls. Keeping the workforce of 17,000 in check was a major task amongst some of the younger, more impetuous girls, keen to assert their independence for the first time away from home. So they had the Women's Police Service. That's the original chair from the staff house. No, you wouldn't want to mess with those two, would you? No. <laughs> this is an incredible bit, isn't it? Because they built a township here. Yeah. Look at it. Great in a township, Dumfries. They complete the school. Hospital, doctor's Hospitals. house, tennis yeah. courts. Staff clubs. No senior male and female staff to socialise on. It was not permitted for the munitions girls. Cinema. The films were regulated to ensure a high moral standard suitable for the young workers. And hockey teams. Yeah. And someone played the tuba. <laughs> we had a brass band. The government encouraged the workers to participate in different activities which were seen as being good for morale, which in turn promoted a more efficient workforce. It was a till, was it? Yeah. Good grief. Because it gave you a receipt out there. Out there, there yeah. Mm, I don't know how that worked. <laughs> <laughs> Complicated. Yeah. It's obviously a, a mine, wasn't it? Yeah. A shell. It's a memorial to animals. Yes, this was erected in. I think this was just been put up last time we were here. It was erected to commemorate animals and homing carrier pigeons fallen in the field of battle alongside our brave British Commonwealth service men and women in all wars and conflicts. Horses. The horses have been deployed on the field of battle throughout their history. Mules and donkeys used to carry ammunition and supplies for the armed forces. Carrier pigeons on metal medals for valour carrying vital messages and save countless lives in wars and conflicts. And of course our friends the dogs yeah. used as message messages. carriers, stretcher bearers and also search and rescue. Brave innocent animals also served. So this is Sir James, a fireless loco. Obviously if you're working in a munitions factory you didn't really want to fires in, in the boiler. No. F oh, sorry, fires under the boiler, boiler I should say. So it was a fireless boiler. What do they use for it? They, they had no fire on board but were charged up with steam from an external boiler before they, they set, set up. Off. Yeah. Set off, yeah. So they didn't have to be fired. Pressurised with steam. Controls were quite simple then. Yeah, so they go an external boiler and they put all the steam in there. Yeah, they pump the steam into the boiler and use yeah. that. I suppose it wasn't going far, was it? Just no, I suppose not, but oh, I don't know how long it would last the steam. Obviously, the brake and pressure That's regulator. Steam. Yeah, I could drive this. Yeah? Yeah. I thought I probably could as well. Just that there. No idea. <laughs> Don't touch it. Perhaps I to learn what that was. Yeah, and that. You yeah. ought to learn what all the controls are really before you go anyway. <laughs> it's a bit green, isn't it? It is, isn't it? 